Okay, let's get started. So good afternoon, everybody. I'm Michael Bellicosa, Community Engagement Manager at Wilton Library. On behalf of the library and the Wilton Historical Society, welcome to the first lecture in this year's five-part scholarly lecture series, Tycoons, Bane or Benefactors. This series marks the 15th year of Wilton Library's collaboration with the Historical Society. And we so enjoy working with our friends and colleagues are there to put this series together every year. First off, I'd like to thank the sponsors for today's lecture, Mary Gale and Jerry Gristina. And also many thanks to those of you who gave a donation when you registered. Finally, let me thank our planning committee. We're all their time and effort in developing the theme of the series, the individual topics, and of course, securing the great speakers. Uh, one logistic note before I turn it over to uh, Steve for the introduction. For the Q&A process, we want you to use the Q&A button in your, Zoom, in your Zoom window, not the chat button. The Q&A button will pop your questions up in front of, the, of us, the panel, and we'll deal with them mostly at the end, although it's possible that Matt may be able to handle a question on the fly if it fits in to the flow of his presentation. So with that, let's get to the introduction of today's speaker. And to do that, I will turn over our online stage to today's moderator, Steve Hutzbeth. Michael, thank you very much. We extend a warm welcome, welcome, welcome to a perennially favorite presenter over the 15 years this series has been running, Matt Warshauer, professor of history at Central Connecticut State University. There's nothing I enjoy more, Matt, than watching you take charge of a room, or in this case, a Zoom, and keeping us all spellbound with so much great information and such a witty and engaging presentation of it. And there's no higher calling these days than teaching history. You are our first responders to what has become incredibly dangerous to our democracy, ignorance. Matt is the author of multiple books and articles on both our state's history and specifically on Andrew Jackson. President Jackson is a person particularly pertinent to this afternoon's session on tycoon Nicholas Biddle. Biddle was the czar of early 19th century US monetary policy and as such arguably a national benefactor, but he was also the bane of President Jackson and many of his time would also add of our entire country. It will be fascinating to hear Matt's take on that and on more. Matt's also done what is a particularly novel and admirable thing, providing his graduate students with a book vehicle in which to have published with his own introduction, their essays on Connecticut history. That's a great gift to those students and also to all of us who care about history generally and about our state's history in particular. So with many thanks to tonight's sponsors and without further ado, I give you Professor Matt Orshauer. Thanks so much, Steve. I appreciate the uh, the warm welcome, though. You know, whenever Steve uh, introdu introduces me, I, I always uh, feel a, a pang of worry that I will live up to his kind words. Uh, but thank you, everyone. And I appreciate you supporting uh, the Wilton Historical Society and the Wilton Library. Uh, I, I do have to say it's a shame that we're not all together. But such are these times uh, in which we live. I, I much prefer to, to be in the, the warmth of all of your company, uh, especially on uh, a, a, a cool day in New England. Uh, it's a lot of fun to always get together with you and actually see you eye to eye, but you know, we'll, we'll do the best we can today. This is an absolutely fascinating subject and it is one that uh, is so incredibly important to what is going on in America today. Uh, we cannot understand uh, really anything uh, as it relates to our nation without understanding our past, without looking at how it is we arrived at where we are today. And certainly the issues of economics and uh, in the aftermath of the 2008 uh, economic crash with the idea that there are financial institutions that are too big to fail uh, and the need for uh, government to step in and bail them out. And the questions about what is the relationship between the government 
and between big business? What is the relationship between government and these mass financial institutions? Uh, should government be able to regulate? Should government be able to control? Should government be able to uh, potentially shut down institutions that are either harmful to our economy and our culture, or at least to curtail the level of power that they have developed? It is not a question that uh, is only relevant for today, though it certainly is relevant for today, but it is relevant uh, all the way back into our past. So, you know, one of the things I'm going to do today is I'm obviously going to talk about uh, Nicholas Biddle and Andrew Jackson and give you a little bit of background about, about them, but we're going to look at a little bit of uh, comic art. And those of you who know me, you know, I love to use cartoons. Uh, I did a, a, a wonderful uh, cartoon display on um, on American foreign policy uh, in cooperation uh, with the Wilton Historical Society, which was a lot of fun to do. And I just, I, I think cartoons are a lot of fun and they tell us a lot about our history. So we begin uh, exactly there. So the title of the talk is The Bank is Trying to Kill Me, But I Will Kill It, Nicholas Biddle's War with Andrew Jackson. This quote, uh, the bank is trying to kill me, is from uh, Martin Van Buren's uh, letters. He writes a book in the aftermath uh, of his time in political office, and he says that one day he walked into the White House, Jackson was not feeling well, it was laying on the couch, and when he walked in, uh, um, Martin Van Buren looked at him and said, why, General, you know, are you all right? And Jackson croaked out, the bank is trying to kill me, but I will kill it. And it really defines the battle that existed between Andrew Jackson, or what now also known as Old Hickory, and with Nicholas Biddle. And so let's take a look at this cartoon uh, a little more closely. You can see uh, the, uh, uh, the blow up of it here. And it says, set to between Old Hickory and Bully Nick. And I wanna mention in, in passing here that this is the beginnings of the development of political cartooning. The 1830s is that time. Uh, with printing press technology uh, and uh, the, the ability to take drawings and make them mass produced and actually place them in newspapers and in other places. Um, this is really the beginnings of the heyday of, of political cartooning that you know, we are obviously very well familiar with today, but th this is where it all begins. And I want you to take a look at everybody in here and let's go from left to right. All the way on the left, this rather rotund woman who is holding a bottle of port, this is Mother Bank, meaning the Bank of the United States. To her immediate right, uh, the man crossing his arms, is Senator Daniel, Daniel Webster of Massachusetts. Directly next to him is uh, Senator uh, Henry Clay of Kentucky. And then the fighter on your left is Nick Biddle. And the fighter on your right is Andrew Jackson, always wearing his trademark spectacles with his shock of white hair sticking up. And then uh, to just immediately to his right is Martin Van Buren or what they often refer to as Little Van because he was of slight stature. To his right is a fictional character named Major Jack Downing. And this was a creation of, uh, of an editor and author named Seba Smith, who was from New England. And he wrote uh, often uh, in many different caricature voices of Major Dak Jack Downing and published them all over the place. And it's, it was sort of the, the early 19th century version of Uncle Sam in some ways. Um, and then to his right is Joe Tammany. And Joe Tammany represents the Tammany Hall political machine in New York. And you can see that he is wearing buckskins. He is definitely on Old Hickory's side. The buckskin would have connected to the frontier mystique uh, that Jackson came from. You can see on Joe Tammany's hat, a cat. And what's interesting is when I was looking this cartoon up, I, I looked at the Library of Congress and they described it as a raccoon. Uh, at the Library of Congress. And I, I laughed to myself and said, do they not know the difference between a raccoon and a cat? This is clearly a cat. And why? Because the tiger was 
often the representative of Tammany, the ferocious tiger. Well, this is not exactly a ferocious tiger. It's a kitty cat on a frontiersman's hat. But also look at to the left of the foot of Joe Tammany. You can see old Monongahela whiskey. Men on the frontier drank good whiskey. Look at what Mother Bank is holding. She's holding a very fine bottle of port. It's the well-to-do that drank the port, all right? So now let's take another look at this from a little bit different angle. And here you have all of the stuff that goes with it. At the bottom, it says, this celebrated fight took place at Washington in 1834. Hickory was seconded by Little Van and Major Jack Downey with Joe Tammany for bottle holder. Long Harry, or known as Harry of the West, Henry Clay, and, and Black Dan, Daniel Webster, were Nick's seconds, an old mother bottle holder. Several long and severe rounds were fought, and from the immense sums bet, many of the fancy were losers to a large amount. Old Mother B is said to have backed her champion to the tune of more than 150,000. So you think about this, it's the fancy who are the losers. They are the well-to-do. They're the stockholders. They're the ones who are, you know, sort of in the sack with, with Nick Biddle and the, the rich and well-to-do that control the bank. This statement of they backed the champion to the tune of more than $150,000 is in reference to the bank spending upwards of $150,000 in the presidential election of 1832. This is something that I'm going to talk about more. It then continues and says, Nick's weight of metal was superior as well as his science, meaning his weight of metal. The metal would have been specie, gold and silver. That's the metal. Uh, as well as his science, the science is his financial acumen and, and the, the concepts of mathematics and finance that, that Nick Biddle used, but neither were sufficient for the pluck and wind of Hickory. And Jackson, of course, his nickname is Old Hickory because he once marched his men back from the Mississippi territory back to Tennessee um, with very little supplies. And, and they were in very uh, tough straits and Jackson gave up his horse to men who were, who were sick and, and uh, not, not well. And his men looked at him and went, he's tough as Hickory. Men, Hickory is a very hard, strong one, and he became old Hickory. And so the pluck and wind of, of Hickory, who showed his thorough training and sound condition so effectually that in the last round, Nick was unable to come to time and gave in. And then it says globe. This was the Democratic Globe, which was the Washington, D.C. newspaper that was the mouthpiece of Jackson's administration. So now, what are, the, what are these various men saying? Well, Mother Bank is saying, darken his daylights, Nick. Put the screws to him, my tulip. Daniel Webster says, blow me tight if Nick ain't been crammed too much. You see how he's losing his wind? Henry Clay says, hurrah, Nick, my kitty. Now him a, now, now him a pelter in the smellers, meaning punch him in the nose. Little Van Buren is saying, Got it, Hickory, my old buffer. Give it to him in the bread basket. It will make him throw up his deposits, meaning the federal deposits that go into the bank. And I'm gonna explain all of this. Uh, and then Jack Downey. If Swan, I swan if the general hain't been taking lessons from Fuller. And Fuller was a, 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 a well-known fighter of the day. Joe Tammany says, hurrah, my yellow flower of the forest walk him into the streak of greased lightning through a gooseberry bush. Now, today, if we look at cartoons, political cartoons, and we are fairly political adept, or we are up with the cultural currents of the times, we can look at a cartoon and laugh at it and understand exactly what it means because we're living in this contemporary time. Well, the people of Jackson's day would have looked at this newspaper and understood it, understood it completely. Now, I consider a cartoon like this very much a primary source document. We can look at this you know, section on the bottom that tells what's going on. We can look at the comments made 
by the various men who were involved in the cartoon itself. And to really be able to understand it, you have to understand the history of the time to place it all in context. So th this is where we start. And, and we'll come back around to it and we'll see if, we, if we've we done enough background to really understand these cartoons. So we been, begin with these two gentlemen. President Andrew Jackson uh, was president from 1828 to 1836. He was the seventh chief executive for the United States. He questioned the bank's stability. He was worried about its power over the economy and its involvement in politics. Nicholas Biddle was the third president of the BUS, known as the Bank of the United States. He was a financier, an editor, a diplomat. He came from a very well-to-do family. He served in both houses of the Pennsylvania legislature. And it's these two gentlemen who are, you know, the, the, the principal combatants in the bank war. It does not mean that there aren't other people involved, but these are the two guys who are really leading the battle. And in order to understand the battle in Jackson's day over the Bank of the United States, we really need to go backwards. So, you know, I wish I had a special effect so I could do the let's go back in time thing. So I'll just go. Uh, so we go back all the way to the founding of the nation. And we have to return to Alexander Hamilton. The United States Constitution goes into effect in 1789. Its first president under the new Constitution, as we all know, is George W. or is George Washington. And the first Secretary of the Treasury is Alexander Hamilton. And Hamilton has got very, very distinct concepts about how the American economy should be operated how the economy is operated is distinctly connected to how we as a culture and a society will move forward into the early Republic. And Hamilton puts forth a series of different reports. He puts forth a report on manufacturing because he believes that the United States should become a great manufacturing nation. He puts forward a report on the subject of a national bank advocating that the United States should actually charter a former formal national bank that will be both public and private. And what do I mean by that? The national bank under Hamilton's idea will be public in the sense that it will be the fiduciary agent for the United States, meaning that it will pay any debts that the United States owes it will handle the vast majority of money that the United States has coming in, whether that money is through the sale of Western lands or is through postal receipts or is through tariffs or duties for exports that are coming into the United States. And those three things, by the way, Western land sales, postal receipts and tariffs are the three main forms of income for the United States. Well, though there is a treasury department under the constitution, there is no formal creation of a national treasury, meaning a place where all the money goes. And what will be the format or, or the shape of how the United States will go about taking in money and sending out money? Basically, what's the fiduciary agent? So the Bank of the United States as this public and private entity will be the public entity for the United States government. In return for doing the nation's business, the Bank of the United States will be able to use some of the United States' money to loan it out and to make money off of it, exactly the way that banks work today. We place our, our money in banks and the banks then take that money and they engage in investments in a wide variety of ways and they earn interest or payments from those investments. Exactly the same way that banks work today, that's the way the Bank of the United States was designed to work. Uh, and the United States for allowing its money to be used in this way would get a dividend or interest payment from the Bank of the United States. So that's the public component of the public private venture. What's the private venture? 
The Bank of the United States is a private entity. It is public in the sense that it does this work for the government and the government has the right to place a certain number of men on the board of directors. But on the whole, the Bank of the United States is in fact a private business. It's a private entity that exists to act as a private economic engine. It's a business and it's designed to make money. So the Bank of the United States has this very dual nature of being public and private. The proposed national bank that Hamilton uh, give, that puts forward, $10 million capital. This is five times that of all American banks combined in the United States when the bank goes into effect in 1791. Two million of the stock will be owned by the government. Eight million will be owned by private investors, many of them foreigners. And so this $10 million is, is the capital stock. It's the stock that the bank takes in and then utilizes for loans and payment. The bank will be allowed to issue its own paper banknotes, its own paper money. Those banknotes are supposed to be backed by gold. You have perhaps heard of the idea of the gold standard, meaning that any money that an institution, let's take the United States, for example, once the United States starts issuing its own paper money, and that really doesn't come until the American Civil War, and that's when we get the idea of greenbacks. Remember that U.S. money right now is, in, is green. Um, it has been since the United States first started producing money. That doesn't come about. That uniform greenback currency does not come about from the federal government until the midst of the American Civil War. Prior to that, individual banks all printed their own money. States would print their own money. And the idea was that that paper money was always supposed to be backed by gold or silver. And the idea was that trading or engaging in commerce with paper money was far more expedient, far easier to do than constantly trying to lug around sacks of gold or fill your pant pockets with you know, a pocket full of silver. Dealing with heavy metals is much more difficult than dealing with paper money. The problem is, what is the true value of that paper money? It's a piece of paper. Uh, it's a piece of paper issued by an institution. The Bank of the United States as, a, as an entity that is far, far outmatches any other bank or set of banks in the United States, it therefore has a tremendous amount of economic clout. So people feel fairly comfortable in the paper notes that it issues. But at any given time, I should be able to take a bank note from the Bank of the United States and walk into the bank and say, excuse me, teller, I would like gold, the equivalent of gold of this $100 note. And they are required to give me that gold. This is the concept of the gold standard. Smaller banks, local banks, perhaps I have enough money uh, that I want to open my own bank, and I, I do so, and I call it the Bank of Matt, and I start printing my own bank notes. I, too, am supposed to have enough gold to back it up, but the problem is maybe I'm not so honest, and I start producing way more paper notes than I have gold to back it up, and then somebody comes in, and they want to get their gold for the value of the paper money and I don't have the gold to back it up. Well, now you've got worthless paper or the paper becomes hugely inflated, meaning that it does not have the real value that it's supposed to have. So what I've just described is the story of early paper money use, uh, not only in the, in the early national period, but in the American colonial period as well. There's so many different forms of paper money that are floating around out there that there's just real difficulty in terms of honesty and there's real difficulty in terms of exchange rates. And now I want you to think back to the last time, uh, probably pre-COVID, that you were able to travel to a foreign nation and you had to exchange your money. And sometimes 
depending on where you went, you made out pretty well with the value of your money versus the value of another country's money. And sometimes you didn't make out so well. This too is a really good indicator of what's going on during this early period in American history. Suffice it to say, there is tremendous fluctuation in the value of paper money. This is one of the reasons that Alexander Hamilton wants to create a national bank so that it will be a big enough economic engine that it can control this massive fluctuation that exists. And the way that it would do this is the Bank of the United States, like banks do today, banks are constantly loaning each other money. It's not as though every bank is, is you know, even contemporarily, is keeping its own assets all the time and that's it. Banks are constantly trading assets, selling assets, making loans, giving loans to other financial institutions. And by doing that, they are actually keeping one another honest because the fluctu fluctuating nature of all these loans and investments, if a bank is acting or a financial institution is acting inappropriately, they're gonna get caught at it rather quickly, or we hope they'll get caught at it rather quickly. So Hamilton's hope is that this national bank will create this, this stabilizing influence in the American economy because it is so, it is in fact so large. So a lot of this goes into the background of, of Hamilton's idea of the National Bank. And so let me just you know, read the last of these bullet points. So the bank acted as the government's agent, holding all federal deposits, transferring funds for payments, making government loans. This is what I already explained. But it also acts as a commercial bank, accepting deposits and providing loans to the public. It issued paper money, regulated loans and values to other banks, and it had enormous power over the American economy. And in this bottom left image here, you can see uh, the very Romanesque style of the Bank of the United States, which is located in Philadelphia, right? And so let's move on to our next slide. Uh, the, the Bank of the United States opens, uh, it, it passes easily uh, and George Washington signs it into law. The first bank opened in Philadelphia on December 12, 1791 with a 20 year charter. It is not chartered you know, indefinitely. It has a 20 year charter to see how it works. It then has branch banks, branch banks in Boston, New York, Charleston and Baltimore by 1792. This is followed by branches in Norfolk by 1800, Savannah 1802, Washington, D.C., 1802, and New Orleans in 1805. The bank was overseen by a board of 25 directors, and the U.S. actually changes to the use of the dollar, which is subdivided in 100 cents as the new currency. Prior to this, the United States was exchanging and operating in a wide variety of currencies. Certainly, we were in, engaged in using the pound, but we were also using um, uh, Spanish coins, pieces of eight, uh, and a variety of other forms of, of currency, both hard and soft, meaning hard, hard specie gold and silver, but also soft paper money. But we switch to the dollar when the bank comes into being. Well, not everybody is thrilled with this concept of Hamilton's bank. Jefferson and James Madison are the two leading opponents of this bank. Jefferson is uh, George Washington's Secretary of State. Uh, Madison is a, a member of Congress in the House of Representatives representing Virginia. And Jefferson says, the incorporation of a bank and the powers assumed by this bill, meaning the bank bill, have not, in my opinion, been delegated to the United States by the Constitution. They are not among the powers specially enumerated. Now, what does this mean? This means that Jefferson is a strict constructionist, meaning that he strictly views the Constitution of the United States. And what does that mean? Jefferson believes that the federal government only has the authority to do things 
that are specifically listed in the Constitution of the United States. There, so for Jefferson, somewhere in the Constitution, it must say, Congress has the authority to create a bank. And the Constitution does not say that. So what does all this mean? There existed no specific language in the Constitution about chartering a bank. Though the federal government could borrow money, regulate commerce, and coin money and regulate their value, right? So there are things that the government can do that are related to things that a bank might do. Well, in steps Alexander Hamilton, whose conception of the Constitution is broad construction as opposed to strict construction. Broad construction says, if the Constitution doesn't specifically say you can't do something, well, then you can if there are other parts of the Constitution that would lend itself to that. Meaning, there are two pieces of, of or two statements in the United States Constitution, the General Welfare Clause and the Necessary and Proper Clause. And what these mean basically is you can use either one of those clauses to utilize other enumerated powers. So in Hamilton's concept of broad construction, his reading on this is, well, look, if the government can coin money and regulate its value, if it can borrow money, well, those are two things that banks do. And in order to make those things happen, well, we can use general welfare, the necessary proper clause, and reasonably deduce that we can create a bank. Even though the Constitution doesn't say we can create a bank, Hamilton's idea is, well, we can do it. And the issue of strict construction versus broad construction is something that develops before the ink of the Constitution is even dry. And it has always been one of the major constitutional sticking points in the history of the United States. And even to this day, we have judges and politicians who say, you know, I want to follow the Constitution the way the founders meant it. And whenever I hear that, I always sort of chuckle and think to myself, well, you're either using this statement for political gain or you don't know what you're talking about. Because this issue of broad versus strict construction was around from the get-go. And it meant that the Constitution was being interpreted. And it all depends on who's doing the interpreting and how much political clout they have to make their interpretation stick. And now I'll give you a good example of this. When the Constitution is first ratified, there is no Bill of, uh, uh, you know, uh, Bill of Rights, excuse me, no first 10 amendments. Therefore, there was not technically any protection about freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, the right to petition our leaders. There was no protection in the Second Amendment because there was no Second Amendment of the right to bear arms. There was no protection against unlawful search and seizure, no guarantee of jury, of, of, um, of trial uh, by jury, right? So all of these things were added specifically because there were some who were worried about the Constitution and its grant of excessive power to the government. And they said, if you don't put language in there through this Bill of Rights, restricting the power of the government, the government is gonna run roughshod. That over time, we know from studying government, studying history, that governments always increase their power. So I just wanna throw that out there so you can sort of understand these larger conceptual issues that are at hand in relation to the bank. So as we continue with these bullet points, more broadly, the Constitution allowed the government to lay taxes for the purpose of providing of the general welfare and make all laws necessary and proper for the carrying into execution the enumerated powers. The necessary and proper clause is the clause that Hamilton uses to push the bank through. So it was this last clause, the necessary and proper clause, upon which Hamilton seized arguing that regulating commerce and coining, coining money and regulating allowed for the creation of a bank. The bank bill passed the House easily by a vote of 39 to 20, passed the Senate 
and President George Washington signed into law on February 25th, 1791. Again, 20 year charter. So that's the bank war. And you look, there's a, a lot in between the bank war and the war of 1812. But the, our next slide is on the war of 1812 because it's a key element in the growth of our economic capacity within government in the United States. The bank has been around, remember that it's chartered for 20 years. It's chartered in 1791, meaning that its charter expires in 1811. Well, Je most of Jefferson's uh, second term in office, his first and his second term in office, are confronting and trying to solve the problem of the Napoleonic Wars. These, this, this, as close to a world war as you're going to get between England and France and their various allies. The United States is a neutral in the Napoleonic Wars, meaning that it's not in on either side, but it is getting beat up by both sides. And this ultimately, to make a very long story short, results in the War of 1812. Some refer to it as a second war of independence. It is a war between the United States and Great Britain. Obviously it starts in 1812, it runs until 1815. It is often known as Mr. Madison's War. It, it, it's a bad war for the US. We do not do well in this war. Uh, you know, Discussing the totality of that war is a completely different lecture, but suffice it to say, there's a couple of important things that come out of it. One of those things is that the Republican Party, this is the party of Jefferson and Madison, not the party of Hamilton. By 1812, Alexander Hamilton uh, is long dead, uh, a result of his duel, his infamous duel with Aaron Burr, but his fiscal policy has continued, at least up until the time that the Bank of the United States' charter runs out in 1811. And in 1811, the Republicans who had never liked the bank are pretty fine, they're okay with letting that charter expire and not creating another bank. They were always opposed to it. The problem, however, is when the War of 1812 starts, they don't have anybody to borrow from. And so you can see the bullet points here. It says the first bank of the United States expired in 1811 when Republicans refused to reissue a charter. We know this with no substitution, meaning there's no new big fiscal agency that really sort of dominates and regulates the American economy. That, that institution doesn't exist. And what happens? State banks print large amounts of paper notes, which don't have any gold backing, and it causes massive inflation, and it badly destabilizes the currency in the United States, creates all kinds of economic problems. The lack of a national bank also left the government with few options for credit during the War of 1812. And we all know that wars are amazingly expensive. And without a national bank to borrow from, the government has to go into debt for a lot of the cost of the war. But they also end up borrowing a lot from the Bank of the United States and from banks in New York. And this teaches them a mighty powerful lesson. And that lesson is, maybe National Bank isn't such a bad idea. And so we move along and James Madison in 1815 delivers his seventh annual address to the United States Congress. We recognize these annual addresses today as the State of the Union. The constitution under the executive function states that the chief executive shall annually deliver an address on the State of the Union. And Hence, you have the State of the Union. And Madison says a number of things in this. And here's a few of the quotes. He says, embarrassments arising from the want of an uniform national currency. Meaning we've had some difficulties because we haven't had a consistent national currency. He says, essential to every modification of the finances that the benefits of a uniform national currency should be restored to the community. So we need a uniform national currency. And then finally, he says, if the operation of the state banks cannot produce this result, 
The probable operation of a national bank will merit consideration. Now, I can't express enough to you what a turn this is for somebody like James Madison. This is the guy who led the charge in the Congress against the chartering of Hamilton's bank. And now after 20 years and after being president for eight years and dealing with the very, very severe economic problems of not having a national bank, James Madison learns from the War of 1812 that wow, the United States might need a national bank. Who says that politicians can't learn? And so the second bank of the United States is born. The second bank of the United States was chartered in 1816, again, with a 20-year charter, again, located in Philadelphia. Again, it is a public private entity. This time the government held 20% of the stock. The capital limit up for stock was $35 million. This is much larger than the First Bank of the United States. But then again, we have to understand that the nation's economy has grown substantially since 1791. There will be 25 branch banks that are placed throughout the country. It will be a source of credit to both the public and the government and it is designed to stabilize the paper money market. So the second bank of the United States is designed to do all the things that Hamilton wanted with the first bank of the United States. But this bank, the second BUS is going to be even larger. So what happens in this post-war of 1812 era? Well, we can talk a lot about post-economic boom. Uh, some of you might have heard of the idea of the era of good feelings. And this is in the aftermath of the war. The new president, James Monroe of Virginia, this is the, uh, the, the third in line of Virginians who take the presidential oath of office. He goes on a tour of New England and he arrives in Boston and a Boston newspaper makes the statement that he ushered in an era of good feelings. And this is the time period, this 1816 to about 1818, 18, 19 period, when the United States is just doing better than it's ever done in its history. You have to remember that as soon as the Constitution comes into being, the Napoleonic Wars immediately create pretty severe divisions within the United States between those who want to line up with France who had helped us in the revolution and those who wanted to line up with England because it was such a major mercantile power. Uh, and those really define respectively uh, Jefferson and Hamilton's views. And then there were also these issues over economics that really divided Americans. Well, in the aftermath of the War of 1812, all the problems of Europe and our connection to it are over with. And one of the things that happens is there's no more enemy blockades against American ships. There's no more American merchant vessels that are boarded and confiscated by France or England or their allies. There's a high, high demand for American agricultural goods in Europe because Europe, the, if the Napoleonic Wars impacted the United States economically, they surely impacted all of Europe, especially Western Europe. And it's gonna take Western Europe a number of years to get back on their feet after the destruction of the Napoleonic Wars. And so the demand for American agricultures, agricultural goods combined with no threat of these ships being seized by France or England provides just an unbelievable economic boom to the United States. There is such a huge demand for American agricultural goods and such a limited supply of those goods in Europe proper that American farmers find out that they can sell anything that they can grow. And American merchants, American uh, 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 manufacturers, they don't really have much of an international market for the goods that they make, but they do have a good American market. And because American farmers are producing so much, 
and shipping so much and earning so much money, it means that they now have money to spend in their own domestic communities, which then benefits the domestic manufacturers in the United States. So all of this economically fits together very nicely. And you've got this just huge economic boom following the War of 1812. Well, this fuels massive agricultural expansion, which of course fuels a land boom. If you're a farmer and you can sell every single thing that you grow, it does two things. One, it makes you buy more land so you can grow more crops. And two, it shifts you away from what had been in 1791, 1793, a largely subsistence style economic market meaning that most farmers were not producing for the market, rather they were producing for their own needs. And most farmers, you know, in 1793, uh, 1791, 93% of Americans are farmers. So they're producing largely for their own needs, not for the market. As time goes on within 20 years or so, the US economy is changing so that there's still, most farmers are still producing for their own needs but they're also producing surplus for sale to the market, which means that there is a burgeoning market economy that is developing in the United States. And it means that farmers are willing to sell stuff and it means that they're getting money for it. And if they have money, they can buy other domestic wares that they can't build or manufacture themselves. They won't build their own shoes. They'll go and buy the shoes. They won't build their own crates. They'll go to a cooper and they'll have barrels built. And so you start to get a more developed economy is my real point here. So you get a huge land boom and you get a huge credit boom because where are people getting the money to purchase this new land? Where are they getting the money to develop these new manufacturing? They're going to the Bank of the United States, the brand new Bank of the United States to borrow, to get credit. And there is a big movement west during all of this. More land, more agriculture, more manufacturing. All of it rolls together in this post-War uh, of 1812 era. Well, the thing is, like all economic booms, they don't last forever. Ultimately, they are gonna come to an end. And they come to an end with the first major economic panic in US history, the panic of 1819. A panic defined as an acute financial disturbance, such as widespread bank failures, feverish stock speculation, followed by a market crash or a climate of fear caused by an economic crisis or the anticipation of such a crisis. We don't use the term panic any longer. We use the term recession. Um, it's a nice, neat economic term thought up by economists. I think a panic is much more apt because a panic lends itself to the emotional state that goes into being with a major economic downturn. What happens? People start losing their money and they freak. They literally panic. That's the definition. Why do we have recessions and panics? Because of overproduction, because of too much speculation, either in land or in uh, stocks, and because too much credit is loaned out and there's not enough real value, either in, in real real estate or in gold and silver or in product to back up the amount of credit, credit that was given out. Can you say the housing crisis of 2008 when far too much many mortgage loans are given out and they exceed the value of the homes? that are actually being purchased. This is exactly what we're talking about. So this is the first peacetime financial crisis in US history, and it hits the American economy hard. And you all know, because we know our recent history, we've all been through recessions. Uh, we've all been through these economic crises. And we know that nothing is worse than having a boom economy and having it suddenly collapse because it impacts everybody and it lends itself to inflation and everything becomes more expensive. We're seeing inflation in the aftermath of, of COVID uh, and because of the supply chain being problematic 
And let's not also forget, because of massive greed on the part of our Plutarchs in this country. Uh, <clears throat> and so this is the first great crisis. Um, the panic, the, the, the Bank of the United States, they handle this panic very poorly. Nicholas Biddle is not the president at the beginning of the panic. The panic, the president at the time was a guy named, uh, the president at the time was a guy named Langdon Chiefs, and he handles the panic very poorly. He forecloses on mortgage, he curtails credit, he, he basically, instead of lubricating the wheels of credit in the, the, the financial sector, he freezes the wheels up and creates an even worse economic outcome. And at the end of the panic, the bank ends up holding huge, they, they own huge amounts of property. Um, and to the lasting enmity of many Americans who remember Jefferson's warning about its lack of constitutionality and that it would have had, that it will have too much financial power. So you got farmers all over the country, land, speculator, land speculators who had borrowed more money than they could really handle. And a lot of manufacturing concerns who had borrowed money who all end up losing their shirts and the bank is sitting there with very little liquidity, but a lot of value, a lot of value. And people are really, really angry towards the banks. And you know, think about the anger towards these, these government, or not government, but towards these um, financial institutions in the United States that are too big to fail. And they end up needing getting, getting needed to bail out by the United States government, by our tax dollars, and they're still sitting pretty and you know drinking port while the rest of us are, are, are slurping bad whiskey. That's the idea behind this. And so I, I felt it important to include a couple of newspaper articles from here. This is from the Kentucky Monitor, January 5th, 1819. It says, the condition of our banks and especially of the state bank in which the Commonwealth has an interest, meaning the Commonwealth of Kentucky, lately compelled to suspend specie payments. What does that mean? They stopped giving out gold and silver. They stopped taking in paper money and giving gold for it because they know they're gonna run out. It's like the Great Depression where the banks stop giving people their money back. It's the same concept. As I understand it from the specie, a pressure from, for, for, for specie from the United States Bank, meaning the United States Bank had started calling in its own specie reserves from other banks Therefore, the banks couldn't meet the specie reserves of the, towards the people. And the refusal of that bank to pay the tax imposed on her branches located in his, this state are subject of primary importance. And then it says, whether Congress can erect an immense moneyed corporation with power to locate branches in the different states without their consent and exempt the stock and capital employed from the common burden of taxation to which the stock and capital of the state institutions are subject is a question of some novelty and of the first magnitude. What does this mean? It means that the Kentucky Monitor is actually questioning whether the second bank of the United States was constitutional. Remember I said that Hamilton pushes this bank bill through, but people at the time question its constitutionality. And there is never anything added to the Constitution for the Second Bank of the United States to make it absolutely constitutional, right? So there, this, this, the people are upset enough that this newspaper writer is saying, you know what? Does Congress even have the authority to do this? And other newspapers follow suit, says the Bank of the United States. Um, this is from the Rhode Island America who has forgotten with what zeal and solemnity the authority in Congress to erect that institution was contested by those who attuned to speak the language of the great majority of the people. So he's referring back to Jefferson's time. Yet now a bank was found to be as, um, uh, as had always believed it to be not only a constitutional establishment, but regarded by its former adversaries as essential to the arrangement of the treasury and to the support of the public credit. Hereafter, however, the opinion of the majority in Congress might resolve once more and the bank again being announced an unconstitutional engine. So again, an article questioning the bank's constitutionality. And then you get Niles Weekly Register, which is one of the national newspapers. And it says insolvency. 
It is sickening to the heart to see the lists of persons who are published weekly in the Baltimore papers as making application for the benefit of the insolvent laws of Maryland, and this would be bankruptcy. The amount of debts due by them is enormous. A similar work is unhappily going on in, in all those large cities and towns of the United States. They who are a little while since the tip of the tongue and residing in palaces are thus engaged in settling their debts and dragging many sober and discreet mechanics and tradesmen along with them. The pressure of the times, the want of something to give a circulation to money, and hence the impossibility of making reasonable collections also prevents many who are really well able to pay their debts from meeting their arrangements. So it's the, it's the freezing up of capital that's the problem. The facilities with which they might have relied on on an emergency six months ago being now wholly denied to them. Such is the horrid state into which unprincipled speculation combined with palpable fraud in too many causes have reduced our country. The paper system has seriously affected our moral character and enough of pure crime has sometimes happened in a single bank to send a thousand little rascals to the penitentiary. So what does all this mean? Some people really don't like the Bank of the United States. They really don't like the paper money system. They don't really like the fact that credit was curtailed so sharply and it has impacted everybody in the country. Now I talked about constitutionality. I need to mention very quickly McCulloch versus Maryland. This is an 1890, 1819, excuse me, Supreme Court decision over the power of taxation. And it is Maryland, a branch bank in Maryland. The, the Maryland, the government of Maryland sues the branch bank in Maryland. Uh, and the president of the bank in Maryland, McCulloch, and they sue him saying, because what happens is that, um, or, or let me reverse that, excuse me. The bank imposes a tax on the paper notes issued by the bank. Let me get this straight. Again, the, the government of Maryland issues a tax on the bank notes, on the paper money that the bank of the, the United States, the branch bank in, in Baltimore is issuing. And McCulloch, the president of the bank, sues Maryland and says, you can't tax us, we're a government entity. It goes all the way to the Supreme Court and in 1819, Chief Justice Marshall makes this statement, the power to tax is the power to destroy. And Marshall recognizes the constitutionality of the Bank of the United States, okay? This is important for us later and I'll come back to it. <clears throat> so when you get to the 1830s, 1820s, 1830s, you've now got a fairly robust American economy. The Panic of 1819 doesn't last forever just like no, no recession ever lasts forever. The, you know, the, govern, the, the economy ultimately gets going again. And we rebound from this. And we, the Bank of the United States still exists. And Henry Clay, a, a uh, member of the House of Representatives and then later a Senator from Kentucky, creates what he refers to as the American system. And this is an integrated economic system that brings the growing industry of the North into agriculture and the agriculture of the South into harmony. He for, first proposes this in 1824. And it, it really is very neo-Hamiltonian. Um, he believes in a protective tariff for, uh, to develop domestic manufacturing. He believes in a robust national bank. He wants uh, federal support for internal improvements, which means what we would call infrastructure today, harbors, roads, canals. He calls for an energetic federal government. He doesn't use the word powerful. That's a bad word in this time. He says, we need an energetic government. And he wants uh, a, a bottom up controlled economy rather than an elite at the top. He wants to create an economy where basically men on the make, the prototype capitalists can make their fortunes. And so now we finally get to Andy Jackson, old hickory. I had said that the War of 1812 um, has a few outcomes to it. One is this new economic model. The other is Jackson himself. 
And if you look at this picture and you think, wow, Jackson looks a little bit like George Washington, he's meant to look a little bit like George Washington. He is the next George Washington. He's the great, next great military hero. Why? Because he is the hero of New Orleans. In the final great battle, land battle of the War of 1812 down in New Orleans, Jackson defeats the greatest army ever focused on the United States. And he destroys that army in the Chalmette Plains in front of New Orleans. And there's no question that his victory at New Orleans it is what takes Jackson to the steps of the White House. He is the first president from common origins. He is born on the frontier in a log cabin. He symbolized and further the shift from a deferential system of government where the elite govern, only the elite govern, only the chosen few govern, govern to a more democratic oriented America where sort of any person of good sense and learning can lead. Uh, Jackson is also very much a man on the make, a strong capitalist who was wary of paper money. He believed in hard money specie and he was pro-bank. Jackson was not entirely opposed to banks. He used them all the time. He engaged in the public credit system all the time. He understood that public credit was an important thing because it allowed one to risk oneself and with risk, and if when hard work comes reward, this is the nature of America's capitalist system. And Jackson was without question a capitalist. It doesn't necessarily mean he likes the Bank of the United States because it is so powerful. And thus we get to our, our main theme, the, the bank war. But I, I hope you understand, I needed to go over a lot of this because you can't understand the bank war without all of this background. So Jackson is elected in 1832. He's one of our earliest presidents to have an actual photo taken. And you can see it right up there in the top left, uh, not the, all the way to the left, but, but uh, the, that right side, that, that is Jackson. And uh, his shock of white hair that, that people make uh, a lot of mention in, in cartoons and paintings and whatnot. You can also see he had no teeth. Uh, so like many Americans, Jackson remembered the bank's role in the Panic of 1819. And he distrusted both its economic power and the very notion of paper money. Jackson was a hard money man. He questioned the bank's stability and the safety of the federal deposits, meaning all of the money, all the federal money from tariffs, from postal receipts, from um, any sort of taxation, from the sale of Western lands, all of that money goes into the bank itself. Jackson isn't sure that that money is safe. He doesn't trust the bank's economic power over the larger American economy. And he doesn't like the bank's involvement in politics. And so on your right, you can see a cartoon of the General, ja of General Jackson slaying the many headed Hydra. You can see Jackson in his cloak, which he wore all the time. He always carried a cane. You can see his famous beaver hat with the black band on it falling from his head. You can see in the center, Martin Van Buren. Uh, and Van Buren is always little Van. He's always smaller in stature. He is helping Jackson to hold the bank in place. And why is the bank the many headed Hydra? All of the various heads are the branch banks. And you can't really see it closely in this image, but um, each of the heads has a state written on it for where the branch banks are. And you can see it better Oops, I'm going to show you this uh, this one again in a minute. But so we move on to the next uh, net one. Jackson fires the first salvo in the bank war. In 1829, in his annual address, at the very tail end of the address, the address is a long address. State of the unions always are. He goes on about all kinds of things going on in the country. And at the very end, he says, the charter of the Bank of the United States expires in 1836 and its stockholders will most probably apply for renewal of their privileges. In order to avoid the evils resulting from precipitancy in a measure involving such important principles and such deep pecuniary interests, I feel that I cannot in justice to the parties interested to, soon, to too soon present it to the deliberate consideration of the legislature and the people. What does all this mean? 
They're going to be asking for recharter in 1836. And all of you folks, you better start thinking about that. And then he says, both the constitutionality and the expediency of the laws creating this bank are well questioned by a large portion of our fe fellow citizens. And it must be admitted by all that it has failed in the great end of establishing a uniform and sound currency. Boom. First shot fired in the bank war. Jackson questions its constitutionality, even though the Supreme Court has determined that it's constitutional. He questions its constitutionality. He questions the expediency of cre creating the bank. And he says that it has failed in its task of creating a uniform and sound currency. He doesn't like paper money. This is the first shot fired. He continues, under these circumstances, if such an institution is deemed essential to the fiscal operations of the government, I have submit to the wisdom of the legislature, whether a national one founded upon the credit of the government and its revenues might not be devised, which would avoid all constitutional difficulties, and at the same time, secure all the advantages to the government and country that were expected to result from the present bank. So what's Jackson saying? He says, should the legislature, the Congress, create a national bank? Well, you might say, well, I thought we were talking about a national bank. We are, but we're talking about the model that Hamilton created. The national bank under Hamilton's model is a public-private entity. That is not what Jackson is suggesting. He is suggesting only a public entity, only a nationally owned, nationally controlled bank, not one that is using government money for loaning and making money off of, not a private entity that can control the economic circumstances of the United States and have sway over every other bank in the country and every element of the economy. Jackson is recommending, I mean, not in its entirety, right? Jackson's recommending the Federal Reserve, right? And so just to jump all the way to the end, in 1913, the United States passes the Federal Reserve Act, creating our current Federal Reserve system of Federal Reserve banks that control our money supply. This is a federal entity, right? And so I'm not saying that Jackson was prescient and, and knew exactly what the nation would do, but I mention this only to show you that the issue over the fiscal status of how the government should collect and maintain and operate its money has been in dispute since the founding of the nation. So Jackson's speech was the first salvo in the bank war. Um, the charter wasn't up until 1836. So you might wonder, why is this an issue? Jackson only serves two terms, right? The bank will go up during the end of his second term. But you all know, economics is never far from politics. And Nicholas Biddle is backed by Henry Clay. Henry Clay, you will remember, is the uh, House Representatives uh, uh, man from uh, the rep representative from Kentucky, then the senator from Kentucky. He is the, the, uh, the brainchild of the American system. And an important part of the American system is the existence of a national bank. He didn't like Jackson in the least. They, they do not get along. And there's a wild, wide variety of reasons for this. But Jackson and Clay are definitely foes. If there is a co-commander of the bank war with, with Nicholas Biddle, it is Henry Clay. And Henry Clay and Nicholas Biddle get together and Clay convinces Nick Biddle to go up for recharter early. He says, listen, Nick, don't wait until 1836 in the last ditch, last hours of recharter. Ask for recharter early. Do it in time for the 1832 presidential election and we'll really shove it in Jackson's face. And here's why. Jackson's political party, the Democratic Party, the Jacksonian Democrats, is a brand new political party. 
uh, the the two party system of the 1825 1826 is only just starting to develop, right? At the end of the War of 1812, the Federalist Party ceases to exist and only the National Republicans continue. Everyone is a National Republican. After the election of 1824, you start to get splintering in that party and you get the Jacksonian wing of the party developing. And so by 1828, 29, 1830, you do have sort of two very loosely affiliated political parties in the country that are, they're, they're still very much in their developmental phase. And the problem for Jackson is he's got a lot of people in his party who hate the bank as much as he does. And he got a lot of people in Jackson's party who loves the bank. And what Clay and Biddle are banking on, no pun intended, well, maybe a little bit of pun intended. Uh, what they're hoping for is that if the charter goes up and the Congress passes a new bank bill and recharters the bank for another 20 years and Jackson vetoes it, there's a whole bunch of people in Jackson's party that love the bank that are then going to scurry away and leave Jackson and he's gonna lose the presidency. If the bank bill comes forward and he's gonna lose the presidency, right? So Jackson will lose the presidency. Henry Clay is running against him in 32. I should have mentioned that. Listen, if Jackson vetoes the bank and the bank doesn't get passed and Jackson loses the presidency, Clay says to Biddle, listen, I'll win the presidency in 32. We'll push through another bank bill. I'll sign it into law, we're golden. Well, what's the other strategy? What if the bank bill goes forward and Jackson feels like he sort of has to sign it? He signs it into law. The bank gets rechartered. There's a whole bunch of people in Jackson's party who don't like the bank, who get mad at him. And maybe they stay with him. Maybe they abandon him. Maybe Jackson wins the presidency. Maybe he doesn't win the presidency. Either way, Biddle still gets his rechartered bank. So Henry Clay convinces Biddle, this is a win-win for you. There's no way that you can lose. Well, this is a perennial problem when it comes to people who are Andrew Jackson's foes, whether they are his military enemy or they are his political enemies. They consistently underestimate his prowess and his skill as a commander. And more often than not, Andrew Jackson wins. And I will say the same thing of Jacksonian historians. There is a huge school of Jacksonian historians who write about a Jackson that I rarely recognize. One who just sort of got lucky all the time. One who was a raving, ranting lunatic and just lashed out at everything, never had a real plan for democracy, that he just sort of was a counterpuncher all the time. Um, and, and it's a Jackson I don't recognize. Jackson, the Jackson I know is an unbelievably calculating political operator. Doesn't mean that everything he did was good. Doesn't mean everything he did was right. Doesn't mean that, you know, he always thought clearly, but, uh, he was not easily defeated. I, I can't really think of any political or military battle the man ever got in that he didn't win. So anyway, uh, Henry Clay, they push, they push for recharter, uh, hoping it'll splint Jack, splinter Jackson's new part, uh, party. And it becomes a major, major part of the 1832 election. And Jackson doesn't care. He looks at this attempt to, to uh, defeat him, he looks at the fact that the bank has spent upwards of $150,000 in the 1832 election to have him defeated. He doesn't worry about whether or not people are going to leave his party. He vetoes the bank. And the bank, Nicholas Biddle, actually on his own dime, has tens of thousands of copies of the veto message printed and circulated throughout the United States because he believes, Biddle believes, that the bank veto message will work against Jackson. Remember that Biddle and Clay think that the veto is going to end Jackson's presidency. This is key. They believe that the veto is gonna end Jackson's presidency. 
So Biddle issues tens of thousands of copies of the bank veto message. But Jackson's bank veto message is artfully, artfully written. And a great deal of it. Now, every president has their speech writers. And there have been some historians who say, oh, Jackson didn't really write this. It's just those historians who say that have not actually looked at Jackson's own writings. With the drafts of the veto message in other people's hand that Jackson is writing on and changing parts of and making sure that certain wording is in there, the backbone of the veto message is Andrew Jackson, no one else. And the way that he describes what the Bank of the United States is resonates completely with many people in America. And here are some of the excerpts of the veto message. The powers and privileges possessed by the existing bank are unauthorized by the constitution, subversive of the rights of the states and dangerous to the liberties of the people. It's a monopoly of its favor and support. Jackson is one of the first presidents to throw around the idea of a monopoly. It seems to be predicated on the erroneous idea that the present stockholders have a prescriptive right, not only to the favor, but to the bounty of government, meaning they get to take, they have a right to American taxpayers' dollars. It appears that more than a fourth a part of the stock is held by foreigners, and the residue is held by a few hundred of our own citizens, chiefly of the richest class. So Jackson is writing about class warfare. He's writing about the 1% against the 99%. He says, will there not be cause to tremble for the purity of our elections in peace and for the independence of our country in war? Their power would be great whenever they might choose to exert it, meaning foreign stockholders, the wealthy. They can do whatever they want, anytime they want. Doesn't matter what's good for the nation. What about what they want? Okay. Um, and then he says, it is to be regretted that the rich and powerful too often bend the acts of government to their selfish purposes. I mean, does this not speak of some of the issues that we have had to confront over the last many years in regards to the question of the squeezing of the middle class for the top 5% of the nation of the concerns over plutocracy? Uh, this veto message is one of the things that makes Jackson so incredibly famous uh, in the long history of the Democratic Party. A lot of this veto message is used by Franklin Delano Roosevelt in the midst of the Great Depression, when he in turn looks at the moneyed class, the moneyed power in the United States. Oh boy, and then the cartoons start. The bank, Mr. Van Buren, is trying to kill me, but I will kill it. And what do you have here? You have Jackson as a jackass. And this is one of the other funny things that exists here. Jackson's enemies referred to him as a jackass. And a jackass is, you know, who wants to be called a jackass? Well, Jackson and his, Jackson is very good at turning unwelcome epithets or, or titles against those who would give them. And the Jacksonians say, oh, a jackass, a mule. Yes, yes, mules, very faithful, sturdy, strong, right? Then you have Van Buren slyly along down there. He is also known, often known as Little Van, um, the, the, the red fox of Kinderhook or the sly fox sometimes known as the little magician, always behind the, 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 in the background, pulling the strings. And here you have all, the, the chicken is, is mother bank going after, and then all the chicks are the little branch banks. And then here is the, the, the image that I had showed you earlier. Here is the many headed Hydra. <clears throat> Jackson, if you look at the cane in his hand, Jackson always walked with a cane. Okay. The cane was a sword cane. And so he had a sword inside the cane. And let me tell you, he used it, right? I literally used it. He got into a, a fracas before he was president with a man named Samuel Jackson, no relation. And he stabbed 
Samuel Jackson with, I, I'm telling you, you, you don't want to mess with Andrew Jackson. You certainly don't want to duel him. So, but on the cane in this uh, situation, you can see the word veto on it. So the cane is the veto. Jackson is used, and again, people at the time would have gotten this. Look at the, the biggest head on the Hydra, and you can see that it says P-E-N-N. This is Nicholas Biddle. This is the main branch bank of the Bank of the United States. This soldier off on the right, this is Major Jack Downey, right? That sort of that um, Uncle Sam figure of the time period. And then you can see all of the various branch bank banks. This one up here is New York, New Jersey, Virginia, Kentucky, North Carolina, Georgia, take your pick, Massachusetts, Delaware, all these 25 branch banks are all the heads of the Hydra and Jackson is intent on killing them all. <clears throat> and so what do these things say? You have Jackson saying, Biddle, meaning Nicholas Biddle, thou monster avant, avant I say, or by the great eternal, I'll cleave thee to the earth. I, three and thy four and 20 satellites, meaning the heads. Maddie, little meaning Mad Maddie Van Buren, if thou art true, come on. If thou art false, may the venomous monster turn his dire fang upon thee. And what this has to do with one, Jackson always, one of his fam famous slogans was, by the eternal. He would say, by the eternal, I will not have this. Well, the thing about Maddie being true or not is, some people thought that Martin Van Buren as this little magician behind the scenes might have been playing Jackson and, and working Jackson for his own, in his own ways. And there is some truth to this. But Jackson is saying, if you're false, we'll get you, right? And then Maddie is saying, well done, General. Major Jack Downing, Adams, Clay, well done, all. I dislike dissensions beyond everything, for it often compels a man to play a double part, were it only for his own safety. And again, this is in reference to Van Buren being this magician where he plays all sides. Policy, policy is my motto but intrigues I cannot countenance. And then you've got Major Jack Downey saying, now, now you nasty varmint, be you imperishable? I swan general that our beats all I reckon. That's the horrible wiper, not womits, venomous wet heads, I guess. So Major Jack Downey was always this sort of wacky character. Uh, that's why the, the strange speech and all of this. And then you get another famous cartoon from this period. Again, you've got a different version of Major Jack Downey over on the right there. Looks a little more Uncle Samish. You've got Jackson standing there. And in his hand is the veto message. Not just the veto message, though. It is, it, you can see it says, order for the removal of the public money deposited in the United States Bank. I'm going to explain what this means in a minute. What you have coming from this order are lightning bolts and look at what they're doing to that old Roman structure of the Bank of the United States. They're blasting it in pieces. And you can see all of these men on these bottom left that are all the financiers and the bankers and they have been knocked down by the power of Jackson's veto and they are running. And you can see the guy with that looks like the devil, that's Biddle. That's Nick Biddle as the devil. And then you can see all these newspapers on the ground and you can see it says Courier and Inquirer, $52,000. National Intelligencer, $10,000. This is the money that Biddle spent and paid various, bank, various newspapers to go against Jackson in the 1832 election. So again, these cartoons are unbelievably on top of what's going on at this time period. So let's take a look at, at what all of this says. So you can see Jackson saying, Major Jack Downing, I must act in this case with energy and decision. You see the downfall of the party engine and corrupt monopoly. And then Major Jack Downey says, hurrah, General, if this don't beat skunkin, I'm a N-word. I'm not gonna say it, but it's historically accurate. So I include it. Only see that varmint Nick, how spry he is. He runs along like a Weatherfield hog with an onion in his mouth. And yes, a Weatherfield hog with an onion in his mouth is related to Weathersfield, Connecticut. 
Weathersfield was long known for hogs and in particular for the production of onions. So there's your Connecticut angle. On the far left, you see one of the guys running away. He says, there is a tide in the affairs of men as Shakespeare says. So my dear Clay, look out for yourself. Help me up Webster or I shall lose my stakes. No more fees to be obtained here. I move, we adjourn, send, sign die. It is time for dear me to resign my presidency, says Nick Biddle. And then there are other things. Uh, there's a second phase of the bank war. The first phase of the bank war is Jackson's annual address and then ultimately the veto message. The second phase is Jackson completely and utterly destroying this bank. He knows that the charter will continue into 1836. And he is worried that if he steps down as president, that another president will come in and reinstitute the bank. And he doesn't want the bank to be in any fiscal condition to reestablish itself. So he calls for the removal of the federal deposits. He says, it's not enough that the bank veto, recharter has been vetoed. I gotta get that money that's in the bank. I gotta get it out of there, right? I need the removal of the deposits. And on the right, you can see this image of Nick Biddle holding up Mother Bank, who is in bed, she's not feeling well, and she is blowing chow. She is vomiting gold coin, specie, getting the federal deposits back. And you can see in your forefront here, there's a bowl that says Bank of America, right? That's already filled up. Uh, and I'll show you what some of the other stuff says in a minute, but I wanna tell you about the story of the removal of deposits. In order to remove the deposits, Jackson has to deal with the secretary of the treasury. He's in charge of monetary policy. Jackson goes to the secretary of the treasury, Lewis McLean, and he says, Mr. McLean, I want you to remove the federal deposits. And McLean says, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. President, I don't believe that I have the authority to do that. And Jackson looks at McLean and says, all right, but I'm gonna reshuffle my cabinet and I'm moving you from secretary of treasury position to secretary of state position. So you're not being fired, but you're being moved over. And Jackson brings into his cabinet, William Duane. Now Duane's father had been a very anti-bank man in the battle in the first bank of the United States battle with Jefferson and Hamilton. And Jackson wrongly assumes that the son, William Duane, is also an anti-bank man. And Jackson goes to William Duane and says, Mr. Duane, I need you to remove the federal deposits. And Duane says, I'm sorry, Mr. President, I cannot do that. And so Jackson just outright fires Duane, says, get out of my White House. And then he moves secretary, or excuse me, then he moves attorney general, Roger Brook Tawney from the uh, attorney general position into the secretary of the treasury position. And he says, Mr. Tawney, I want you to remove the federal deposits. And Tawney finally gives him the right answer. He says, yes, Mr. President, I shall remove the federal deposits. And Tawney does so. And I should say, and this is a little bit of a technicality, they don't really remove the federal deposits, okay? They spend down the deposits that are already there. They just stop depositing federal money in the Bank of the United States. So it's not really a removal, but that's the way it's talked about. It's just a little bit of an aside that I wanna make sure I'm accurate. Um, well, this creates a, a, an absolute firestorm, excuse me, an absolute firestorm because Jackson is, this is one of the instances I believe that Jackson goes a bit too far and, and he just pushes matters to such an extreme that it, it makes him look really, really bad. It makes him look like he doesn't care what anybody else thinks. He doesn't care what Congress thinks. He's just gonna do what he, General Jackson thinks. And so <clears throat> this creates a, a lot of problems, which I'll describe in a moment. Sorry, I'm, I'm okay. So he, here we are right here. So here is the larger image of, uh, that, that image I showed you, it says the doctor's puzzle or the desperate case of Mother U.S. Bank. And I've already showed you Nick Biddle over there holding Mother Bank 
who's puking uh, specie. And then you've got um, you know, Henry Clay and Daniel Webster who are here. Uh, you've got in the left-hand side, you've got General Jackson looking in through the window. And then in our next image, you've got what's being said here. And if we go all the way from top left, um, Jack Downey is saying, why General, I never knowed you was a doctor. And Jen Jackson says, no more, I ain't Major Downey, but I've read the American Family Physician and know what a kind dose, what kind of a dose to give to clean out a foul stomach. And then you've got Henry Clay saying, what, what do you say to the application of my patent American, meaning the American system? Daniel Webster says, I wonder how a few grains of common sense was washed down with Boston particular would do. They're all trying to figure out what to do. John Calhoun says, doctor, your American system won't do here. Desperate cases require desperate remedies. A few of the leaden pills of nullification and some blood taken will suffice. And this is, I'm not gonna go and explain all of this, but this is in relation to Henry Clay's um, battle against Jackson and the nullification crisis of South Carolina. Then Mother Bank is saying, oh, dear Nick, I am dreadful sick. And Nick Biddle is saying, um, damn that Dr. Jackson, this is the effect of his last prescription. And the last prescription of course is the removal of deposits. And then you can see Mother Bank, Bank of America, on the floor on the ground is veto, an order for the removal of the deposits. And then you got Mechanics Bank on the far left bottom. And you got a guy sitting there with a newspaper saying, alas, alas, no more fees, meaning that the banks aren't gonna be able to charge exorbitant fees to the public any longer. So then, and we're, we're getting close to the end here, Fang. I know I've been going on for a little while. You've got, uh, this is a famous image of Henry Clay and it's called Plain sewing done here. And he is just simply, it's called symptoms of a locked jaw. And it's Henry Clay trying to shut Andrew Jackson up by sewing his mouth shut. And what this has to do with is Clay is so unbelievably outraged over Jackson's removal of the deposits that he goes into the Senate uh, and I, I should mention, I, I said it in passing, but we've also got to remember that Andrew Jackson wins the election of 1832. He vetoes the bank and still wins the election. So Clay and Biddle's plan just absolutely backfires in their face. The, re, the early recharter plan backfires. Jackson wins re-election and then he says, all right, now I'm gonna really crush the bank by removing the deposits. And in order to remove the deposits, he does the, all of these things that, really reveal tremendous presidential power to some extent going a little too far with re the removal of two secretaries of the treasury and you know all of these things so clay in 1834 has a majority in the senate and he pushes through a censure resolution in the senate against andrew jackson and it says basically on this day the Senate of the United States censured the chief executive for uh, taking power that he doesn't have. And what does this really mean? It means nothing. The constitution doesn't say anything about the right of any branch of Congress to censure the president. The only thing that the Congress can do if they believe the president has acted unconstitutionally or has engaged in high crimes and misdemeanors is to impeach him. And when the Senate censures Jackson, Jackson writes a 23 page response saying, you don't have any authority to censure me. Impeach me if you think you can do it, please go for it. And what you have on the left is the actual Senate journal of the, of the uh, censure resolution. And here is a close up of it, okay? And now, you might wonder why is it blocked out in a, why is there a black box around it? And if you look at um, what it says across the journal entry, it says expunged by order of the Senate, this first day of January in the year of our Lord, 1837. So the censure resolution is put in the Senate journal in 1834. 
And in 1837, after Jackson has already retired, the Democrats take control of the Senate again, and they hold an all night rally to expunge the Senate, sen the Senate resolution to get rid of it. And what's the real importance of this? Nothing. It is all about political game playing. And so what do they do? They draw, they go back to that old page of the journal, they put a big black box around it and they write expunged. It's, it's all about political gamesmanship. And so what do you get as a result of the bank war? Well, you most certainly get the birth of a brand new political party in the United States, the Whig party. And you get King Andrew the first. And you can see this image. This is Jackson as the, as the old man, or he's often shown as an old woman. He's got a crown. He's got uh, monarchical robes. He's got a scepter. And his left hand is a veto. And what is he standing on top of? Torn up pieces of the Constitution of the United States. This is the Whig Party's view of Andrew Jackson, born to command. King Andrew I, a veto memory. And Clay specifically uses the term Whig. Whig, W-H-I-G, comes from the English or the British Commonwealth era as um, when that time when there was no king. And the best time to complain about a king is when there is no king. And so they take on the, the term Whig specifically to show that Jackson is a... Uh, so uh, we finish really here. Um, Nicol, Nicholas Biddle in the aftermath of all this in 1834 says, this worthy president thinks that because he has scalped Indians and imprisoned judges, he is to have his way with the bank. He is mistaken. This is February 21, 1834. Biddle is the one who's mistaken. He loses the bank war. And he does the worst possible thing he can do. He raises interest rates. He severely contracts loans throughout the entire banking system creates a lack of credit and ties up the American uh, economic system, ties it into knots. And so he proves what Jackson had always said, that Biddle and the United States Bank has far too much power over the American economic system. And I mean, it, it just, he does, Biddle does exactly what Jackson had warned of. And so the Bank of the United States, it continues as the Bank of Pennsylvania, but it, it's greatly re, re, reduced in influence. Biddle resigns as president in 1839. The bank collapses in 1841. And it's now a portrait gallery on Chestnut Street in Philadelphia. So there you have it, my friends, the bank war of between Andrew Jackson and, and Nicholas Biddle. That's it. Matt, that's an extraordinary presentation. You've taken us through so much of American history and win such a wonderful presentation. Thank you for that. In light of the time, I'm going to suggest that maybe we should not do a question period at all. Um, I and apologize in fact, for running along. No, 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 not at all. I'd much prefer to have that kind of detail, and I'm sure our audience does too. So, with that thought in mind, um, I, and I've looked at the questions in the q and I don't think there's any that uh, really need to be dealt with here unless, would, would you like to look and see if there's anyone that you particularly would like to address? Well, I only see one question here and it had to do, yeah, it had to do with the, the, the name Tammany, Tammany yes. Hall and why Tammany took a particular name. Um, my understanding, I'm no expert on Tammany Hall, but my understanding is that Tammany Hall used an, a, a, quite a number of Native American uh, terms uh, in their organization. And that's about as much as I can give you on that. Great. Well, Matt, thank you again so much. And we really appreciate all the effort and thought you put into this program and what you bring to us. And we're looking forward very much to the wrap up when this series ends that you're going to be doing too. Well, my so with friend, that, many I, thanks. I hope I didn't go on go on too long. I hope it was engaging and people. No, uh, I think it's it. it's the detail. It's the detail we really needed to understand this topic, and really appreciate your putting it together in that way for us. But isn't it remarkable the degree to which it resonates today? It's amazing the parallels, and you drew them out very well. Thank you for that too. Yeah, it's absolutely wanna, amazing.
I just want to throw in there also, thanks, Matt. Really interesting. And Steve for uh, moderating and doing the introduction. I just want to thank everybody for sticking with us. I'm sure you got a lot out of it. Certainly a lot of information, a lot of things I didn't know. And I'm a big Andrew Jackson fan. Um, just uh, and we'll see you. We'll see you folks in the next two Sundays for lecture two and lecture three. And then, as you probably know from looking at the registration, there's a few week break, and then we have lecture four, and then a, another few week break, and then Matt's coming back to synthesize uh, the series. So um, enjoy the rest of the evening, folks, and see you next week. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good night.